by Eric Johnson, and it's the design of the mini neutron spectrometer for the lunar hydrogen mapper. Thank you. Just for the record, um, I'm not Eric Johnson. Um, I'm Jim Christian, and I'm speaking on behalf of the lunar uh, HMAP collaboration. I think the laser pointer is this one. Um, and so it's a, it's a collaboration bet between many people. The good, the good news about being the last talk is you can take as long as you want. <laughs> yeah. And so I just want to acknowledge the other team members um, uh, who, who contributed to this project. Um, I'll, I'm going to blow through a lot of these uh, initial slides because um, Ariel and other people have covered them uh, uh, very extensively. Um, the Luna HMAP mi mission, of course, is again, we're just looking at um, the distribution of, of hydrogen, uh, which we think is associated with water on the lunar surface. And, and the goal is to sort of examine cold trapping of hydrogen um, within the top meter of the lunar surface and, and of course, evaluate the uniformity of, of the, the distribution of hydrogen in permanently shadowed regions and, and really just to provide a higher spatial resolution um, for imaging uh, this hydrogen. And again, this is um, the lunar HMAP is a 6U CubeSat. Uh, which will be launched in 2008. Again, uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, essentially, there's cold regions on, on, the, on the lunar surface. So this is the South Pole. Here, Shackleton, this is where we'll be focusing. And of course, there's been data, um, UV albedo data, that suggests there's a possible um, a volatile material there. Uh, this is just a, rem uh, just a, a reminder, um, of course, uh, the, new, the, the, the moon actually generates neutrons, and they're generated when uh, fast uh, or co cosmic rays hit the surface, and you get reactions, and you generate neutrons that basically um, go into the soil, and some of them es escape. And, and the goal that we're, we're trying to do is when you put hydrogen on top of this, it basically moderates the epithermal neutrons. And so we're looking for a decrease in the epithermal neutron count rate. Um, this basically shows a simulation of uh, this is the energy of the neutron as a function of the neutron flux comparing, say, uh, dry soil to wet soil. And you can just see that the count rates go down here. And basically, these neutrons are moderated, and they show up at lower energies. Um, again, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, there, there has been work done prior to this. Um, Lunar Prospector um, spectrometers provides excellent data um, for, for the presence of neutron, uh, for the presence of um, possibly volatiles uh, near these uh, permanently shattered regions. But of course, um, it's not really a, a strong correlation. And there's been, um, and they use a neutron spectrometer, and other neutron spectroscopy measurements have been done as well that sh that show, um, you know, some correlation, um, but there's still some sort of discrepancy in terms of um, the correlation between uh, the the absorbed epithermal neutrons and these permanently shattered regions. Um, so this just shows the, um, the the orbit that the Luna H map is going to take. It's a, a highly, um, um, I don't know, elliptical orbit. Um, and, and the whole goal is to basically be able to go very close to the lunar surface, uh, less than 10 kilometers above the lunar surface. Uh, th this sort of shows the family of curves. And if you're looking at the South Pole here, you, I mean, you can't see many of the features, but this sort of shows the crisscross path that the, um, that the satellite's going to take. So the data that we're interested in is, is really right around Shackleton and at the South Pole. Um, uh, again, I was obligated to put some kind of equation here. So our, our goal is to uh, basically uh, map the attenuation of the epithermal neutrons, and we relate that to the hydrogen concentration using a model I think um, that Tom Perryman's developed. So just to give a summary, um, uh, this is the Lunar Prospector neutron spectrometer. Um, uh, this uses two helium-3 tubes. Um, one helium-3 tube is covered with uh, cadmium, and the role of the cadmium is to absorb the thermal neutrons. Um, the tin, oops, I'm sorry, the tin-covered tube um, is just to measure the total neutrons. When we were looking at what neutron detector to pick for the Luna H map, you know, we certainly considered helium-3 tubes. There's some other neutron detectors that are available. Uh, lithiated glass works, um, as well as boron-loaded plastic. Um, but there's really a concern about background rejection from both of these materials. And for the, for the Luna HMAP, which is a CubeSat, uh, our real concern was just basically being able to get a good close packing with helium-3 tubes in a sort of a constrained and um, sort of fluid CubeSat volume. Because you know, as you start to um, stuff the CubeSat in, things have got to move around because somebody says they want a propulsion system someplace. And we say, who needs a propulsion system? What's really important is the neutron detector. 
Um, but nonetheless, uh, so we've got to uh, sort of try to make things work and squeeze things together. Um, so what we've decided to use is a, a sort of a new scintillator. Um, it's, it's, it's relatively new. It's um, this uh, click, which is a cesium lithium yttrium chloride. It's a scintillation material. Uh, it contains lithium, and lithium is what does the new, which, which, which generates the neutron signals. Um, of course, we're in full production of these um, of this scintillation materials. We're using in, in handheld um, radiation monitors, um, and we're making as large as three-inch diameter bulls. Um, the important thing to note about this is that the neutron signature, this is an ambi spectrum, um, and this is proportional to the light amplitude or the energy, and um, this is just the, the counts, um, is that, is that the, um, the neutron uh, spectra, or the peak, is, is well out here at about 3.4 MeV. Um, this is just showing a, a shaping time dependence uh, for collecting all the light. So, so the real um, good news about this is it's really separated from potential um, uh, background signals. And I'll, I'll show that a little more um, uh, as, I, as I go on. Um, again, we've done some simulations for what kind of neutron count rates we, we expect to get. And, and this is just simulating the lunar prospector. And we're getting about 22 counts per second uh, for, the, for the cadmium covered. That's sort of what we're focusing on in our, um, in our detector. And of course, we looked at things like altitude, whether or not the altitude would give us a higher count rate. And, and um, it turns out it doesn't give us much of a higher count rate because we're, we're already so close to the moon that essentially it looks like an infinite plane. So it's not a point source anymore. Um, and so, so what we were trying to do is basically say, let's design for a similar uh, count rate as, as the lunar prospector uh, neutron detector. Um, these are our anticipated backgrounds. Uh, we're using a scintillation detector. Um, so um, the anticipated backgrounds is, is we will be detecting gamma rays. Um, the, the, but because the, the neutron peak is all the way out at 3 MeV, this is a log scale. Um, and these are sort of three different measurements of the, of the gamma spectra produced by the moon. Um, you, you're going to be out, out here somewhere as opposed to in this region where the other scintillators uh, occur. And so um, just looking at these, we, we expect to get about maybe five counts per second uh, from the background gammas on the moon. The spacecraft, we do not expect very many. And, and of course, there, there's going to be protons coming in, and they will cause the scintillator to light up. Um, but the good news is that these protons uh, will probably wind up at very high energies. So these will be very strong peaks. Um, so, so sort of the, the, the lesson here is that um, you know, this signal will, will be way out um, well beyond you know, 10 MeV or more. Um, and, and of course, um, again, we don't think they'll pose much of a background. There'll be a little bit of trickle. But um, the bottom line is that the, the background, just using energy gating to, to sort of separate our signals, um, uh, we expect to be very small. Um, the, this shows the, um, the neutron spectrometer on here. Here's the satellite. This is the 2U that we've got to deal with. Um, this is what we're building here. Um, this shows the spectrometer. Uh, there's basically two separate and identical detectors just for redundancies region. Um, each detector contains a bunch of click and PMT detectors uh, and PMTs, um, some electronics and some a frame and some housing. So um, this just sort of shows some of the specifications. And um, of course, this is our performance in terms of sensitivity. And of course, there is a size and a weight specification. And anyone who's used to building nuclear detectors, um, you know, the, the, usually the first thing you want to do is make it big and make it heavy. Um, so, so, but we've got to um, live within those constraints. Um, this sort of shows us um, just comparing the, the detection efficiency of this scintillation detector to the helium-3 tubes and, and what thickness we need to achieve. Um, this is assuming that you've got about 100 square centimeters of area, and we just varied the thickness and said, well, we want about two centimeters thick thickness of this click, and we'll achieve about the same sensitivity um, as the helium-3 tubes. Um, this shows the sort of the configuration that we're considering, um, and this, this shows the relative count rate. This is the 22 from the, uh, from the lunar prospector. Um, because we've got basically 200 square centimeters, um, we believe we're a factor of two above that. Uh, this shows the count rate as a function of mass and, and thickness. And again, obviously, when you're building nuclear detectors, you want to get, you know, the, high, the higher in mass and thickness you go, the better off you are. Um, but we were pretty much constrained um, to about two centimeters by, by mass. Um, this, this shows um, uh, the prototype module that we've built. Um, this is basically in a, in, a, in a housing here. Here's the photomultiplier tube. 
Um, one, one thing to sort of mention is that um, there's sort of newer te detector technologies other than photomultiplier tubes that are going to be much better and more suitable uh, for CubeSat environments. These are these solid state photomultipliers. Um, but the problem with those things is that um, you really need good temperature control and you probably have to operate at lower temperatures. And, and because this was sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we needed a more mature technology, we weren't sure what kind of temperature uh, control we would be able to achieve, um, we selected these photomultiplier tubes. Um, th this sort of shows um, a spectrum of, of this. This was uh, fabricated. Uh, this shows the americium beryllium spectrum. Um, you can see that it's not one peak, um, but that's because we started off with a, um, a scintillation material that was cracked. Um, we started off with that because, um, although it sounds easy to just to put the scintillator in a can and have it coupled to the PMT, it's not. So, so we're basically working on that. Uh, this is just a quick summary of the electronics. Uh, it's relatively basic. This is the um, control, the Luna HMAP C and DH uh, control and data handling computer. Um, this is sort of a separate system here. Um, it's microprocessor based and an FPGA. But the philosophy here is um, we're just taking the signals here and immediately digitizing them. And then what we do is essentially we integrate the waveforms to determine whether it's a neutron or a gamma count. Um, and of course, this just sort of shows the, the, the possible data products we can produce. Um, um, more than likely, uh, this will be what we can actually send will be limited by what we, uh, the bandwidth available through this, um, this uh, deep space network. Um, this just sort of shows another plot here that's unique to this scintillation material, and that is that the shape of the pulse, the scintillation pulse, actually depends on whether it's a neutron or a gamma. And, and the reason why that's important is that um, when you make plots, um, you, this is sort of some shape factor versus the energy, the neutrons are well separated from, from this plot. And you can get this by simply breaking up, instead of doing the total integral, you do an integral from point 0.1 to point 0.2 and point 0.2 to point 0.3, and you can generate these histogram plots. Um, so, so this ability really gives you um, the ability to get distinctions as, as good as um, a helium-3. Um, uh, finally, we just sort of show a, oops, sorry, a back of the envelope calculation or estimation of, oops, I'm done, oh, okay. Uh, so, so let me just finish off with this slide. Uh, this is just sort of a, a, back, a background estimate um, of, of our, what we think our errors are relative to hydrogen concentration. The plot's a little bit busy here because um, the actual uncertainty depends on the hydrogen concentration, and it also depends on the distance to the pole. And the reason why it depends on the distance to the pole is because um, the orbits are overlapping, so we're able to accumulate more and more data. So this just sort of shows the detector kit that we've sent. And uh, just to summarize, um, there, there are some very interesting and new technologies for, for neutron detection, tech, for neutron detection um, that we're trying to take advantage of. Um, and of course, we're, this is work in progress. Thank you. Um, so there actually is a measurement uh, using the lunar prospector neutron and gamma ray spectrometers. I also did this analysis with LEND, myself, David Lawrence, and Dana Hurley, uh, result on Shackleton, and I mentioned it before, the fast neutrons and also epithermal neutrons, highly consistent, a very robust measurement. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, maybe it's on your sensitivity plot, and for me, sensitivity is the sensitivity to the amount of hydrogen, not so much the count rate. Um, but how do I say this? Given our spatial footprint with Lunar Prospector, all we can say is that there is a significant signature consistent with Shackleton Crater. But we can't say if it's in larger concentration in smaller pools um, or if it's evenly spread throughout the, the floor of the crater, for example. Um, one thing to consider here is not just the weight percent, because we actually have a very robust measurement of that, but the weight percent as a function of the spatial extent of those deposits. Yes, so that's you can a do a better job in principle of localizing those deposits, but at the same time, those deposits may have to be, while they, if they're high, more highly localized, they actually have to be a higher concentration. It's actually a two-dimensional plot. It would be nice to put, not just because they're my data points, but it'd be nice to put the actual measurements that have already been made and, and see how they 
play out. Uh, what parameter space you're really sensitive to? Excellent. That's a very good point. Thank you very much. Because um, we are, in some sense, um, the, the idea of going to a higher spatial resolution is to look for the non-uniformities in the hydrogen distribution, where, where you, you have, apparently have data um, that suggests that um, there'll be much larger weight percents than, than just sort of these global averages. Ah, oh, such a good